Welcome to Tales from Flat Space, a podcast of science fiction and fantasy by yours truly, Gina A. Pond. Just know that the stories in this podcast may contain content that could be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. This is Unity, part two, station, chapter 13. Jack. The console flared up with lights, indicating an incoming priority message. It made me jump in surprise. There really hadn't really been any other comm traffic in the last eight hours besides the regular telemetry from the planet, now that Jenny and I had scrubbed her code to stop the false comms. <laughs> the message was marked global, not for any particular person. Captain? I started, just as Mark, who was at the op station, also said, Micropicket just appeared, sir. Beckett looked up from their station. Play the message, Jack. Unity Station A4413 from Survey Ship Lightbringer. Receive message and are willing to help. Arrival within one hour of picket. Message end. One hour of the picket, Mark said. No way. The captain gave a small chuckle. Never seen a survey ship before, Ensign? Uh, no, sir. (laughs) You're in for a treat, then. I won't spoil it for you, but yes, they should be here soon. All the proximity alarms went off at once. The comms channel from the EV team setting up the quarantine hub was suddenly alive with people all talking at once. Holy shit, what the hell is that? Fucking survey. Hey people, back to work. It's just the survey ship we asked for. But boss no ship that size should move like that. Fuck me, Nils. Did you see that? Yeah, dude. Holy crap, that's big. Or right about now. Jack, show the ship on screen and put me through to the HAB team, the captain said. And I opened the channel for them. The ship filled the screen entirely, forcing me to adjust the cameras to as wide a frame as possible. Mark cursed when he saw it. It looked like a massive tube of at least 20 concentric rings hung with large, rounded, rotating boxes. Jack had heard about the amazing ability of survey ships to jump to precise coordinates, but no human can do a jump where they ended up aligned nearly perfectly with another vessel or a station. The ship used its flashes to gently align with the station so it could extend its docking tube, which began to extend from the ship to the station's docking port. All right, EV team, said the captain. That is, indeed, a survey ship. They have a bad habit of just appearing out of nowhere. I'm sure they'll apologize to you for startling you once it's finished talking. A chorus of, yes sir, and yes captain, followed, and the chatter from the EV team settled down to normal. I turned down the station channel and switched over to the ship-to-ship channel. A female-sounding voice came over the comms. Station A4413, this is the survey ship Lightbringer requesting permission for connection and docking. Survey Ship Lightbringer, this is Station A4413. You are approved for docking and connection. Switching to SDA channel now, I answered. Thank you, Station. Attaching docking tube now. Switching to Lucifer. Survey Captain out, responded the female voice. You'll have to forgive my captain, Captain Beckett. She's not much of a talker to people outside survey, but she does make me laugh, said a smooth male voice with a slight accent. I am Lucifer, the AI of the survey ship Lightbringer. We received your request, and my friends and I can certainly help you in your situation. Thank you, Lucifer. We really appreciate it, said the captain. I'm already discussing strategies with your CMO, and have a demon rider preparing to collect samples and let your planetary team know that we're working on a solution. I am fully connected to the station now, so if you or any of your crew need to talk to me, they can just call for me. We will get your pre-call team home, Captain, one way or another. The captain breathed out a sigh of relief. Thank you again, Lucifer. Right. The docking tube is in place and secure. I suggest that you make your way over to meet my captain and the biochemistry team. I also think the demon rider is coming on to consult with your medical staff. Yes, they are. Until later, Captain. The comm channel turned off by itself. The captain chuckled. Well, folks, if you haven't met or rather experienced a survey AI before, you now have. It's a bit odd, but you'll get used to Lucifer being around. Jack, anything new from the pre-call team today? I shook my head and said, 
No, sir. Just telemetry. They nodded and stood up. Okay. I'm off to meet Lightbringer's captain and team and escort them over to medical. Keep watch here, Mr. Kirby. Yes, Captain. I turned back to my station and turned up the sound on the HAB team's channel. Mark was monitoring the ops station and coordinating with the EVA team. I checked the comm traffic again, seeing the uptick in local traffic, but the pre-call team traffic still stayed null. My risk comm buzzed, notifying me of a personal message. I keyed it open. To Lieutenant Kirby from Lucifer at Latebringer. Lieutenant Kirby, contact me when you are back in your quarters for the night. Lucifer. I didn't have to ask how, but I was certainly wondering why. Unless it knew that Marsha and I were the ones who blew the whistle on Beckett and Morgan? Knowing what little I did about survey, I could guess that Lucifer knew everything that happened since they were now connected to the station. The AIs on survey ships were practically omniscient, so the rumors said, so it wouldn't surprise me if they knew about Jenny, too. I deleted the message without answering and went back to my duties. I got back to my bunk later than I had planned, since the EVA ran over. I picked up a packed dinner from the mess and opened my door on autopilot. I was tired enough that I had forgotten that Jenny was still in my room, and startled myself when I saw her on my bunk. Oh, shit, Jenny, I forgot you were still here, I said, as she sat up from the bunk. She blinked at me for a second. Yeah, still here. Figured I should sleep since I'm taking your old shift. I waved her back onto the bunk and took the desk chair. No worries. I put my dinner on the desk. Oh, crap, I should have picked up one for you, too. It's okay. Marcia came by around dinner time and brought me food. She caught me up on everything and said that you were on comms full time. She paused, thought for a bit, then continued. You know, in all my work to make a new life, I never thought to apply to survey. I mean, I know they have a habit of taking misfits on, but I thought the heist and being part of the crime family would be disqualifications. You hear rumors about survey, but I didn't really believe any of them. I laughed. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of the rumors are their own propaganda. They're quite a secretive group, you have to admit. Speaking of that, Lucifer asked me to contact them when I got back to my quarters. I'm guessing it'll be about you, since survey ships seem to know everything. Not everything, Lieutenant Kirby, but definitely everything that has been logged in this station in the last few years. I assume since you were talking about me, I could join in the conversation, said the smooth, masculine voice. Jenny and I looked at each other, and she shrugged. Uh, sure. No time like the present. Do you mind if I have my dinner? And you can call me Jack, I said. No, I don't mind. Most of the discussion will be with your friend here anyway. So, Ensign Jennifer Fraser, my new friend Marcia says you are looking for asylum with survey. Jenny sat up straighter on the bunk. Yes, sir. Lucifer laughed. Simple yes or no will do. I'm not your commanding officer. The woman nodded, and Lucifer continued. Let's see. Born Julian Kozalezi, a New York colony, received degrees from NYCU in computer programming and hardware design, both bachelor's and master's at 16. Was one of the youngest to do so outside of Terra. Left academia to, I assume, work for the family business. It's right about that time when Niemand began to do more daring work. Then comes the hacking of the New York Colony Bank, and Julian disappears forever. And a couple of years later, a brilliant young recruit named Jenny Fraser enters the Unity Academy at New Zurich. Do I have this right, my dear? Jenny listened to Lucifer describe her life with her mouth open. She closed it and nodded. How? I thought I'd left no trace. Jenny looked really frightened, more so than when she told us about being blackmailed. For me, it wasn't hard, as we have been following you for a long time, but also that political officer has just sent your file to the Unity Attorney General. It seems he's blaming you for his current state of arrest. Jenny put her head in her hands. Oh, fuck. Quite, Lucifer said. However, I need someone with your particular talents for a special project... I would grant you full citizenship and survey for this, since this is a dangerous task and may put you in situations that could compromise your identity. I... what do you mean, situations that compromise my identity? 
She looked at me, and I shrugged. I had no more idea what they wanted from her than she did. Well, Miss Fraser, it means you might have to interact with those who may harm you or kill you because you have changed genders. If they figure it out at all, that is. Jenny looked scared, but thoughtful. She looked at me, and I shrugged. I couldn't make this decision for her. She lifted her head and asked, You'll protect me from my father? As much as we're able. Certainly you'll be protected while you're on any survey property. When you're not in our direct care, I can't guarantee anything. I'll have to work something out with Unity, but that will be easy to arrange. I don't ask you to do this lightly. You are the right piece at the right time in a very big puzzle, Miss Fraser. And if things go as we think they will, you might be more important than you realize. Jenny relaxed, and to my surprise, smiled. All right, then. You've got a deal. Excellent, said Lucifer. Just let me inform your captain and my captain, and we'll get you aboard. I already have quarters set aside for you. I will send someone to collect your personal effects. Marcia can do that and give it to whoever comes to collect it, I said. Jenny, just let Marcia know what should be packed. Yeah, okay. But how are you going to get me out of here without any of Morgan's folks seeing? Lucifer laughed, and a small square, metal, and floating box suddenly appeared in my room. If you would take the box, Miss Fraser. Uh, okay. And she reached out for the box. As soon as she had it in her hand, it disappeared, taking Jenny along with it. The fuck? I exclaimed, as I nearly dropped my dinner. My apologies, Jack, for her sudden departure. I felt it was more efficient to get her on survey property right away, Lucifer explained. No, I agree, but what was that thing? Don't tell me that survey can do teleportation now. Lucifer laughed again. After a fashion. That, my friend, was a nanopicket. In the space where your station is, we can accomplish this sort of thing. It's a useful trick that we don't advertise, and it's useless in a gravity well. Unfortunately, as much as my siblings and I can manipulate space in the places where space-time is flat... We still can't go in system. I suppose that gives you some assurance, eh? Assurance? I asked. That humans will bees be needed for something, Lucifer said flatly. Um, I said, not feeling really assured. The AI gave an audible sigh. Not funny? I keep working on my humor. I shook my head. No, not really. Kind of creepy, actually. There was a moment's pause. Thank you for your honesty, Jack. I like you. Really? Thanks, I said, and feeling a bit shocked, as there were rumors that AIs tended to recruit hard when they decided they liked someone. I wasn't sure about leaving the Unity for survey. Not now, anyway. I leave you to the rest of your dinner then, Jack. The demon rider is almost ready to launch. Thanks, Lucifer, for helping Jenny out, I said. Yes, yes, we shall see. And with that, Lucifer left. I finished the rest of my dinner thinking about what it meant for an AI to like me. Chapter 14, Jack. Within hours of the Lightbringer arriving, the morale on the station seemed to improve greatly. When I entered Ops the next morning, there was a sense of excitement in the air. Jansen was on watch when I came in. Hey, Kirby, she said, giving me a small smile. I returned the smile and went to my station. The XO continued as I settled in. The Demon Rider is getting ready to head out, and we'll use real-time comms with us until they are out of range. It should be about two weeks, but Lucifer says they'll do regular comms from the planet. Yes, sir, I'm on it. She laughed. No doubt there. I turned around and waited for the real-time comms while I sifted through the morning mail. Nothing from the pre-call team, but plenty to shunt to the pickets. Traffic from station had increased now that everything was out in the open. Surprisingly, there wasn't much coming out of MedLab. I wasn't sure if MedLab staff didn't send a lot of mail out because of loyalty to Dr. Carr or if Morgan had a plant in the med lab. I figured Morgan had probably bought more people in other departments, not just the captain. 
Considering what happened with Jenny, I wouldn't doubt it. But who? It made me angry that I had to think that way. Yo, Station, you there? Said a voice over the comm. I flipped the switch. This is A4413 Station. I take it you're the Demon Rider? I replied. Yeah, man. I'm going to jump in in just a second. But I just want to let you know that once I finish collecting samples and send them back, I'll be on text-only comms. Understood. Um, what should I call you? Oh, right, yeah. I'm Darian, and my ride is Demon 3. D-M-N-3. Deep Space Module Nonspecific. I smiled, trying real hard not to laugh. Thanks, Demon 3. Happy hunting. Thanks, man. Going in and getting your samples is the easy bit. Coming back is more fun. Later! And before I could respond, he was already gone. Damn, they're quick, Mark said. A bit unorthodox, I said. Yes, Mr. Kirby. They're some of my otter children, but they do get the job done, said Lucifer, chiming in from the station comms. The demon should already be in orbit and sending out its drones. Once they have the samples and any relevant comms, they'll send out a micro picket, which can go much faster than the demon rider. Barring any complications with Darian's equipment, the micro picket should be back in about six days. No way, blurted Mark. I was thinking the same thing. The fastest a human could really safely travel was about 10 G, but that still wouldn't take a good month, and the ride would suck. Jansen gave Mark a look, but it was Lucifer who answered. Yes, well, Ensign, the micro picket can accelerate to 25 G, and it only needs to get to a place of flat space time, and then it can jump back. The samples will be cushioned, and the blood samples set up so that the 25G will partially centrifuge the samples for the biologist, saving the researchers a little bit of time. In the meantime, Commander Jansen, in the meantime, Commander Jansen, our staff is going over the med staff's work as I speak to you. It looks like my team confirms your team's findings, and we have the facilities to synthesize the ATP supplement they'll need in bulk so the pre-call team can at least make it to the scaper and back to the station. Darian will be able to give anyone who's conscious instructions, or have the drones give the injections. Oh, thank the gods, breathed Jansen with a sigh of relief. I'll let the captain know. I already have, Commander, said Lucifer. Oh, right. I can almost hear her mumbling fucking AI in her mind. I apologize for the breach of protocol, but... Since we do need to work at speed, I felt time savings was warranted. Jansen sighed in resignation. Yes, right, fine. Just make sure I'm kept in the loop. Understood, Commander Jansen. Lucifer dropped out of comms. I thought it was interesting how it seemed like they left the room when the conversation was over, but I knew they were able to listen in on any conversation. I wondered how the survey citizens dealt with an AI listening in all the time turn back to my station, although there wasn't much to do until we started getting signals from the demon and the micro-picket. While I shunted more of the outgoing mail, I felt someone behind me. Don't turn around and make it like I'm just watching the mail over your shoulder, Jansen whispered. Listen, I want to thank you. I knew someone was in the gym that night. I hoped it was someone who we could trust to do something, and luckily it was you. I owe you one, Kirby. A big one. I was shocked. I didn't realize she had seen me at all, never mind that she knew I had heard her in the captain's conversation. Uh, thanks? Just doing what's right, you know? Thank the gods someone is, she said. She patted me on the shoulder, then went back to her station. Mark, how's the supply getting on with the outfitting the quarantine hem? In this game, there are no accidents, Jack, the Morgan said. No shit, I thought back at her, still a bit stunned by the conversation. Marsha. I looked at my wrist comb. Twenty more minutes and I can get him out of my office, thank the gods. Since the captain had declared the pre-call mission a failure, Jim seemed inclined to actually do his job instead of harassing me, which I was both grateful for and a bit suspicious about. I think this is all we can plan for the moment, at least until we get more information from the Demon Rider, which should be in the next day or so. Good, he said. 
He was sitting on the couch, which he always did, regardless of what I wanted. So, he drawled, I heard that it was you and your little lapdog who got Morgan arrested. I frowned. Lapdog? Yes, Jack and I uncovered his part of the conspiracy. I sighed. I won't talk about this with you. I think you should leave now. Jim stood up and came around my desk, putting himself in front of me, invading my personal space. No, I don't think so. And Morgan is an idiot anyway. He had me trapped. There was nowhere to go. Oh shit, I thought. Papa! I shouted in my mind. Suddenly, Jim's hand was under my chin. He held my face in a painful grip, forcing me to look at him. He smiled. Now, woman, I'm going to take what's mine, and you're going to like it. He leaned over and kissed me hard, forcing his tongue into my mouth. I couldn't shout. I kicked with my legs and tried to scratch with my hands, but the way we were angled, I couldn't get a hit in. He grabbed me in a vice-like grip and pulled me out of the chair, turning so that he could pin me to the couch. Come on, you little bitch. You know you want it from me. You've been teasing me all this time, telling me no, trying to tell me you're asexual. You just haven't had enough dick in your life. His eyes weren't quite sane, and he was looking at me like I was some sort of prized piece of meat. He held me down and kissed me again, using his arms to keep me down. But when he moved one arm to try and get my pants off, he was thrown off balance, and I was able to bring my knee up and kick him in the crotch. He grunted and let go of my other arm. I shoved him to the floor and launched myself from the couch to behind my desk, and I put my chair between me and him. He stood up, breathing heavily. You fucking dirty pleb. You're nothing, do you hear me? You're fucking slut, just like all your race. Get out, I said through clenched teeth. He laughed. You think anyone's going to believe you? Black little bitch like you? You're lucky to get anything from any man. I slammed my hand on the door plate on my desk and the office door opened. Get out, I screamed. Pitch, he started to say. But then suddenly someone grabbed Jim from behind and pulled him out of the doorway. I heard a body slam against the wall outside my door. As I ran out from behind my desk, I could hear struggling and then Jack saying in a calm but deadly voice, Try it, motherfucker, I dare you. When I got to the door, Jack had him pinned to the wall with his arm under Jim's throat. The blonde man went still. Jack looked sideways at me as to keep an eye on the other man. Is this person bothering you, ma'am? He asked me in the same deadly voice, which I knew wasn't all him. I could see other eyes looking out from his. I held on to the door jam, shaken, but relieved that Jack and whatever spirit was with him had come to help. Yes, I replied in a shaky voice. My reply made Jack's face turn to marble. He pushed his elbow a little further into Jim's throat, then looked around at the growing crowd. His eyes found someone, and he called out, Mark! Mark came over, looking nervous. Mark, since most of the legal staff are under lock and key, I need you to go find the XO or the captain and have them come down here. Marsh has been assaulted and needs to make a statement. Both of them, if you can manage it. Have them meet us in the chapel. Mark's eyes widened in understanding. Then I could see anger wash over his face. He looked at Jim for a moment, then said, Yes, sir, and ran off, tapping his wrist comb. Come on, asshole, into the chapel, Jack said twisting the man around and pinning his arm behind his back. He turned to the crowd that had gathered. You can all leave now, he said loudly, with the same cold voice as before. Some people jumped, and others suddenly remembered they had things to do. Jack turned and marched Jim into the chapel. I followed in a daze. He shoved the man to the far end of the chapel and ordered him to sit. There were no chairs on that side of the chapel, so he had to sit on the floor. Jack stood over him and said, don't move, or I will kill you. Just give me an excuse. For a second, I thought he was going to smirk and talk back to Jack, but when Jim looked him in the eye, something there made him nod submissively. It was then that the captain, the XO, and the doctor came running into the chapel, followed closely by Mark. They stopped short when they saw me, and Carr immediately came over and started examining me. Captain, she's got bruising on her neck and shoulders, consistent with being grabbed. 
Carr said quietly when the captain came over to me after talking to Jack. Sam nodded. Let me get this asshole out of here, Marcia, and I'll take your statement, okay? They said gently. I nodded, the shock starting to set in. Carr coaxed me to sit. Mark, get security down here on the double, Sam ordered. Mark left again. From the corner where Jim and Jack were, I came laughing. Why are you protecting that little black bitch, huh? Not man enough to take her? Then again, I heard you were just a little faggot anyway. Shut the fuck up, asshole, Jack said in a much more dangerous tone before. The others in the room stared in shock at the use of ancient earth slurs. The room went quiet until Jim let out another terrifying laugh. <laughs> She's mine, you faggot. I own her. And she was good, too. Too bad you can't get it up for her. Jack moved so fast that not even Jansen could stop him. There was a sound of flesh hitting flesh. Jack had knocked the man unconscious. When Jack moved to start kicking him, I yelled, Jack! He turned towards me, breathing hard. He's not worth it, I said quietly. Jack spat on him and then went to the other side of the room, facing the wall, to try and calm him down. Security came in. Sam took a deep breath. Take that asshole laying down in the corner to his quarters. It's Dr. Adelson. I want two guards on him 24-7 and pull all his biometrics and access permissions so he can't try and get out. Man's lost his damn mind. CMO, I second that assessment, Carr said, still looking shocked. The guards took in the room, and me, and pulled the man none too gently out the door. Sam watched them leave, then shut the door to the chapel. The XO was talking to Jack, who seemed to have calmed down some. He nodded, then went around to his cubicle. I could hear him picking things up, the noise of the recycler, and moving his chair. Marcia, said Sam. Yes, I said, blinking. Do you want to give a statement now, or do you want to wait until after you go to medbay? Medbay, I said, not really comprehending. Yes, the said Dr. Carr in a gentle voice. I need to examine you completely, and it would be better to do that in medbay. He lied, I said. He couldn't get my pants off. I need him in the crotch. Jansen came over and kneeled in front of me. Marcia, Dr. Carr still needs to examine you, okay? Do you want me to take you? I nodded. And Jack. All right, she said. I can get her statement, Sam. Sam nodded as Kate gently helped me stand. My legs were wobbly, but suddenly Jack was there and offered his arm. I could feel the strength in him supporting me as I took it, and the three of us left the chapel. Chapter 15. Marcia. Two hours later, after getting examined by the doctor and giving my statement to the XO, I was ready to leave the med bay. I put my uniform jacket back on and said to Jack, I need to get out of here. Hang on a sec. Went over to talk with Dr. Carr and the XO for a moment, then came back. Okay, Doc says that we can go. I'll take you to your room, okay? I nodded. Jack held out his arm, and I took it, grateful for the feeling of support. The halls were quiet, as it was dinner time, which I was grateful for. There were a few people who came through the hall. Some looked at me, saw me being escorted by Jack, then nodded and went about their business. I guess your TKO has gotten around, I said. I'm not surprised, he replied. Also, Adelson wasn't well-liked, and you were loved by the crew. I think a lot of people think of you as a mom, so some folks may be a bit overprotective of you for a few days. I also think that if Adelson weren't locked up, he'd be dead. We reached the lift, and I looked at Jack as we took it down to quarters. I was shocked. I'm not that special, Jack, I said in a quiet voice. He put his hand on mine. <laughs> you are, Marcia, believe me. I nodded. He's not wrong, granddaughter, said Papa. We reached my hallway, and I started to panic. Jack, I can't stay in my room. His quarters are close to mine. He knows where it is. My breathing became shallow, and I started to sweat. 
Okay, Marcia, it's okay. We'll go to my room. Come on, he said, as he gently turned me around and back to the lift. We went down one more floor, and as we got further away from my quarters, the panic started to ease. I took a deep breath. He palmed the door to his bunk open, and we went inside. He sat me down on the bed. Do you want tea? I think we could both probably use some. I nodded. He busied himself with making tea. My body felt like lead, but my mind was starting to actually think again. Lucifer? Yes, Reverend Brooks? Are you all right? I heard about the incident earlier, Lucifer answered. Jack looked at me in surprise. I'm okay for the moment, I said. Can you check this room for bugs and my room too? In one moment, they said. Jack nodded in understanding and finished making the tea. Suddenly there was a small popping sound from the desk lamp, and little streamers of white smoke were visible in the light. The fuck? Jack said. Anger rose in me. I wondered. What about my room, Lucifer? Yes, there was one in there, too. There seems to be one in all the staff rooms. I have dealt with them all. Fucking bastards, Jack said. Yes, quite, said Lucifer. Not very skillful, though. You're all set, Reverend. Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, not right now, Lucifer. Thanks, I said. Jack handed me the tea and sat on his desk bench. I stared at the mug in my hands, not looking at Jack. To be honest, I was embarrassed. How did I let him get so far? I thought. Hey, Marcia. Yeah? Jack took a breath. Why didn't you tell me he'd gotten worse? It wasn't an accusation, just a question. I... I wasn't sure if you'd believe me. Came over to kneel in front of me so I could see his face. Marcia, I would have believed you, and I do believe you. That bastard is more than he seems. I think you're right, I said. I should have known that you would believe me. I'm sorry. Jack shook his head. For what? You have no need to be sorry. Sorry for not trusting you enough. Even Papa told me to tell you, but I didn't listen. He patted my hand, then stood up and went back to the bench. It's okay. You've helped me at my lowest and stupidest. The least I can do is help you now. You're my friend, Marcia. Closest friend I've had since the pre-call mission. So much older than you, though. I could almost be your mother. So? Just because you're older doesn't mean you can't have close friends of any age or gender. Listen, I don't know about you, but I feel like something more is going on here than just a failed pre-call. I felt that even before the damn warrior princess in my head started talking to me, especially about Adelson. He always felt wrong. I think that's partly why I wound up doing my sessions with you in the first place. Something in me... In me Something in me didn't want to tell him anything personal at all. I wish I had listened to that instinct myself, but I was professionally obligated to do sessions with him, I said. What did he do to you, Marcia? I was giving my statement when he, you gave yours. I looked up at him and I realized my face was wet. When did I start crying? I wondered. I took a deep breath. Jim, he... He's been wanting to, me to sleep with him since I got here. First, it seemed like just annoying flirting, but when I told him I was asexual, he seemed to take that as a challenge. He backed off for a little while after that, but after you got here, it started again. Beginning with the sexual innuendo, and then extra long touches and trying to hug me in public places. I took another deep breath, and my voice started to become quieter and flatter. And then, today, he actually came around the desk and grabbed me. He he kissed me hard and was holding me so hard he said, Come on, you little bitch, I know you want it from me. You've been teasing me all this time. Then he held me down on the couch and tried to take my pants off. He had to lift an arm to do it, so he was off balance. That's when I managed to kick until I hit his balls. 
He let go, and I told him to get out, and he just stayed there looking at me, staring at me like I was property or something. He stood up and said, you fucking dirty plebe, you're nothing. Do you hear me? Who's going to believe a dirty bitch like you? Like he said in the chapel. That's when I yelled at him to get out, and you came running. I began to shake, and Jack came over and gently took the mug out of my hand so I wouldn't drop it. I could almost feel the anger coming off, Jack. Holy shit, Marshall, that was rape. That asshole was lucky I only decked him. It wasn't worth it, Jack, I said. I don't know, he said, then looked thoughtful. I wonder. Adelson's around 70 or so, right? I think so. I looked at Jack, and he seemed to be thinking something over. Marcia, that's not the first time I've heard ancient slurs like that from an old white guy. While the doctor was checking you out, I had a small flashback to this guy on the scaper. Real asshole, and nobody really liked working with him. We used to assign soldiers who got into trouble to work with him. He was a scientist nearing 80, but pretty fit. I still wondered why he was on the pre-call team, but he called me and Hans faggots on the scaper. Most Unity folks only know those words as ancient slurs, and would never think to use them against anyone. But pleb is a new one to me. How would they know to use those slurs if they didn't learn it? Oh my god, they're not from Unity, I realized. It seemed so far-fetched, but it was the only explanation that made sense. Jack nodded. Cho mentioned in Ops one night that there were lost colonies of hardcore religious fanatics that supposedly cut off all ties to Unity and was never heard from again. I read a little bit about it later, and the article said that some of them went so far as to destroy their stations. It doesn't mean, though, that they wouldn't necessarily come up with their own tech and ships after a while and try and come back. There were rumors in Unity Intelligence, but no one really believed them publicly. Most of the colonies were supposed to be too xenophobic to have anything to do with Unity. Marsha, if that scientist in Adelson can move into fairly good positions in the colony program, that means that they could have people anywhere within Unity. People in important positions. They could have been working on this for years, decades even, and... Jack looked horrified. I didn't want to think of the repercussions of religious fanatics within the Unity government. Adelson was one, but what if Morgan was too? Who else on station could be working for them, or actually one of them? We looked at each other, and we didn't have to say it out loud. Who do we trust? I held up my hand. Jack took it. We stayed that way for a while. Oh well, my friends, said Lucifer, making us both jump and let go of each other. I now know that I can trust you, since you have come to the same conclusions as Survey. Or rather, my siblings and I. But one thing at a time. Now that I've exterminated all the illegal bugs on your station, we need to focus on getting the pre-call team back. Exposing religious fanaticism will need to wait. But I promise you can trust me, and Jenny too. Keep your eyes open, friends. And with that, it left as we continued to stare at each other. Well, I said, yeah. The adrenaline and shock were finally wearing off, and I was exhausted, but I didn't feel safe enough to sleep. And frankly, I wasn't too enamored of being without Jack's protective presence. I yawned. Uh, do you want to stay here tonight? Jack asked. I blinked. What? Just to sleep, so you won't be alone. I know where to get extra sleeping stuff, thanks to Joe. Oh, I said, relieved. I let out a laugh that sounded only slightly edged with hysteria. Religious staff slumber party? <laughs> Something like that, I smiled. Okay, sure. I paused. I'd rather not go to my bunk by myself right now. I don't blame you, said Jack. Right. Stay here while I raid supply. I'll lock the door when I go out. I nodded. As he got up to leave, I grabbed his hand again. Thank you, I said, for protecting me. 
I take my job just as seriously as you do yours. Go ahead and take the bunk. Maybe we can watch a vid when I get back? I nodded and let go of his hand. He left, locking the door behind him. I went over to the desk and gulped down the rest of the tea Jack had made for me. I took off my shoes and uniform jacket, then laid down on the bunk. I was sure I was too keyed up to sleep. I closed my eyes, thinking I'd just try and relax a bit before Jack came back, but my body had other plans. Sleep went out quickly over my mind, replaying the feel of Jim's hands holding me down. S Chapter 16 Jack The older folks are able to move around a bit, but all the soldiers and younger folks seem to be flat out. The head scientist says that they can't do much more than feed themselves, go to the bathroom, and set up IV nutrition for the worst cases. He also says that the canaries died last week. They just kind of fell asleep and never woke back up. They were super relieved to hear from me, though. They thought y'all had forgotten about them. I sent you all their blood samples, along with grass, soil, air, and water samples. But seriously, man, it's pretty rough down there. If you got anything to help them, you better send it fast, or they may not make it. Right now, the most alive ones can barely walk across the room, let alone get to the scaper. My resources on the demon are still good, so I don't need any resupply. Later. As the last words of Darian's message from the micropicket winked out, the rest of the staff in the room stared at each other, then at the captain, who was stone-faced. They just quietly said, Doctor? The CMO cleared his throat. Well, yes, the samples are with Lucifer's folks right now. They agree that it looks like some bacteria-like organism, but it also has some viral characteristics. We think the ATP supplement will work to counteract the symptoms, but it's just a stopgap measure. In fact, because of the imprecise dosing, it could do some damage. The head xenobiologist from Lightbringer chimed in. Once we can isolate it from the samples that Darian sent us, we'll have a better idea of what direction we need to go in. The ATP supplement should at least get them up enough to where they can get to the scaper and on their way back here. The captain nodded. The chief engineer raised his hand, and the captain gestured for him to speak. They'll have to go on autopilot if they're that bad off. Lucifer, would Darian be able to patch into the scaper, or maybe send a drone in with the crew? Darian wouldn't be able to patch in without Unity codes, but he can certainly send one of the sample drones in to manipulate any controls that needed to be manipulated. The engineer nodded. Luckily, the scapers are pretty foolproof. All he'll need to do is have the drone press the auto launch button and ensure that the door seals are secure. Can the drones manipulate door plates? Yes, Darian has a drone capable of that kind of work. He most likely already has it on planet since it is useful for soil and water collection. Right, so once they can get to the scaper, they should be okay until they get here. For some value of okay, I thought, but didn't say it. Beckett thought for a moment, then said quietly, They'll have to leave the dead there. It'll be hard enough for them to get all the live personnel into the scaper. Dr. Carr spoke up. But, Captain... No, the Captain is correct, Dr. Carr, Lucifer interrupted. We can have Darian instruct the drones for burial, which I assume will be suitable? The Captain straightened in their seat. We'll need to check their religious preferences, but yes, that is correct. Jack, have Marsha look up the Canary's files, would you? Carr, you and Lucifer's team synthesize enough of the supplement to get them up and about on the planet, and through the five months it'll take them to get here. Then keep working on figuring out how to cure this thing. Jack, help Dr. Carr and the chief record the instructions for Darian. How long for synthesis? The doctor thought for a moment, but it was Lucifer's xenobiologist that answered. We can synthesize it on Lightbringer in 24 hours. The CMO looked like he wanted to say something else, but then nodded. Good, then let's get to it. Dismissed. Everyone stood up and started to leave. I started to follow the rest of the staff out of the conference room, but the captain said, Jack, can I talk to you for a moment? Yeah, sure, I said and turned around. The captain motioned me to have a seat, and they waited until the room cleared and the door closed. So, they said... They hesitated for a moment. So, uh, 
How's Marcia doing? Better. Still shaken up, though. I think she can handle general duties for the moment. I didn't say any more, since I didn't know how much the captain knew outside of Marcia's statement. When's the carrier supposed to get here to, uh, cart them off? I almost said the assholes, but I figured I'd stay diplomatic. Beckett gave a look that said I'd made the right call, even though they were thinking it too. Captain Mitchell is on her way. Uh, she's the closest to us at the moment, but it's still going to take her six months to get here. Apparently, they had to do an in-system live cargo delivery jump for Rosalind Colony. I also sent her the data to give to some of the biologists, since, since next to Lightbringer, Rosalind's also one of the net best for biomolecular research, or so says the doctor. Last message I got from Andrea said she had some scientists who were interested in joining the team here to help out. That's great, I said, trying to inject a little optimism in my voice. I didn't think it really worked, since the captain frowned. What's it going to be like for them, Jack, on the way back here? They asked. I took a deep breath. I knew they had to ask, but memories came floating to the surface and I tried to push them to the side. Jack? I snapped back to the present. Sorry, I was miles away. Happens when I think about it. I paused again, took another breath, and said... Do you remember the small group dynamic seminars in the academy? Yes. Not well, since it was a while ago, but yes. Well, forget them. I mean, they do give you an idea of what can happen, but the reality is much more intense and much harder. On station, with a couple hundred people, the factionalization is a bit weaker, just because of numbers. But on the scaper, there's crap food, nowhere to escape your fellow passengers except for your bunk, and the fact that your leaving was because of a failure. You'll know that it wasn't your fault, but it will feel like your fault. Frankly, Captain, they'll be mighty pissed off by the time they get here. At you, at Unity, and each other. I stopped for a minute, weighed down by what came next. I would also bet that more than a few of them will be suicidal, especially the science director and the Unity commander. I hope that most of them will be too weak to do much but sleep, but which will mitigate some of the issues, but it won't stop the emotional impact of failure and the loss of the canaries. Even with Marcia doing counseling, when they get into comm range, it's going to be ugly. The captain looked worried and guilty. As well you should be, I thought, uncharitably. They should be feeling that, said the Morgan, and they need to know exactly what they're in for. I agreed with the Morgan in my head, but brought my attention back to Beckett. They hesitated, then asked quietly, Did anyone suicide in your escaper? I could feel my pulse quicken, anxiety rising to the surface. I swallowed, and responded in a tight voice, Yes, the field commander. The bugs killed her wife as she attempted to get to the escaper. Her wife's group got ambushed, but it distracted the bugs long enough that our group could just barely get into the scaper. My mind started to fall into a flashback, but I fought to keep myself in the room. The panic was starting to take over, and the only thing I thought of was to shout in my head, Morgan, help! There's a price for this boon, child. You must tell the full story to someone you trust soon, so that you can deal with this better. For now, though, I can make these memories more manageable for you. Take a deep breath and close your eyes. I did as I was told, and suddenly the panic stopped. The memories seemed less sharp, less spiked with pain, and I found that the anxiety was ebbing. I took another breath. Thank you, my lady. There was a feeling of calm and love from her, and she faded into the back of my mind again. I opened my eyes, and the captain was looking at me with concern. Are you okay? they asked. I nodded. I will be. PTSD can't be shut off like a switch, sir. Beckett nodded. Understood. They thought for a moment. Jack, I want you to work with Marcia to finalize the psych schedule with the folks from Lightbringer. I'm sure she'll need the help, and she seems to trust you to keep her safe. Also, since you'll need to work with the med team to record instructions and all that, just swing through ops in the afternoon. 
Since most of what we're doing is waiting, I can r rotate some of the other ensigns through comms the rest of the time. They paused. I know this is hard for you, and I wouldn't blame you if you were pissed at me for fucking this up royally, but for what it's worth, I appreciate everything you've done for the pre-call team and for Marsha. I stared at them, then said, Permission to speak freely, sir? Looking resigned, they nodded. I looked them in the eye. Why? What the fuck were you thinking? I let it happen, Jack. I nearly doomed that team to die for my fucking ego. For promises that the senator and political officer couldn't keep. That kind of fame and money makes humans stupid. I let my desire for success override my duty to make sure that the team survives. They turned back from the wall and looked me in the eye. I'll see this through, Jack, whatever it takes and whatever prison sentence I end up with. I will make sure they survive. They're not lying to you, and I admire their humility, the Morgan said. Surprised at her response to the captain, I just nodded my head to both. I understand. You don't need my forgiveness, though. You need theirs. And you'll need to forgive yourself eventually, if you can. I stood up and went to the door at the other end of the room. I palmed open the door as the captain said behind me, Are you sure you're not the chaplain? You certainly talk like one. Only by association. I'd rather carry the gun, I replied and walked out. I found Marcia later in her office with the door open. I went up to the threshold and knocked. Hey, I said. Hi, the chaplain said. Come on in. You okay in here? I asked. She looked up. With the door open, I've been taking se sessions in the library, and one of the nurses who used to be a social worker on Earth is taking my male-identified clients for the time being. I nodded. The micropicket came back. They need us to finish planning the psych sessions with the pre-call team. The captain wants me to help you with that, since I suppose I'm the only other person available. I also have to help with the Xenobio team record their instructions for the Demon Rider. It looks like I'm back to part-time with comms, although it's all days now. Marcia gave a small smile. Thanks. That'll be good, she said. Um, and I just had an interesting thing happen to me. The captain was asking me about my pre-call fail, and I was starting to have a panic attack and flashbacks. Then I asked the Morrigan for help. And? She did. Marcia gave a knowing smile then. They can do that for you, although it does come with a cost, usually. Do you know what your payment will be yet? I nodded. Don't leave it too long, if possible. Spirits sometimes get impatient. Yeah. Marcia went back to typing on her tablet. I sat and thought for a moment, and then decided I could wait a bit longer. Marcia was the only person I could trust to tell this story to, but I didn't want to burden her with it while her own pain was still fresh. She can take it, said the Morrigan. Not now, I replied. The Morrigan faded away again, but I was curious about something. Marcia? Hmm? Does your spirit help you with your emotional state, too? She put down her tablet. Yes, Papa helps me with many things. You called him that before. Who is he? Papa Legba. He's, well, to put it very simply, he's a trickster and the guardian of the crossroads. He is the reason why I get the little bags of candies on occasion with the rest of the religious supplies. It's part of my contract with him that I make him offerings. He's not the only spirit I work with, but he's my patron spirit, I suppose you could say. Huh. That explains some of the things the Morgan said. No? Oh. Marcia raised her eyebrows. Well, when I asked you to come to my rooms to talk about the fake data, she said that he already told you. When I asked who he was, she said it wasn't her story to tell. Marcia nodded, then smiled. The Morgan suits you, though, as a warrior. Yeah, I suppose so. 
funny, though. The captain asked if I was going to become a chaplain. Really? What did you tell them? I grinned. <laughs> I said that I'd rather carry the gun. <laughs> the older woman laughed. What? I said, laughing a little myself. Figures I'd get the warrior priest to be my bodyguard. She laughed more when I looked at her in confusion. Marcia, I'm no priest. I crossed my arms in defiance, although part of me knew that she was serious. Right, sure, okay, she said, smiling a more mischievi mischievous smile. She laughed, and I could see Papa Legba come through with a wicked grin and a wink. Somehow I knew between me helping her and him, we'd get her back to her full self. I sighed. Okay, whatever. So what do we need to do to plan for the psych sessions? Yes, back to work for us. These things don't plan themselves, she said with her own sigh. And we brought our focus back to the job at hand. Later, when we took a break, she said in all seriousness, You would make a good chaplain, Jack. I was going to deny it again, but this time I just said, Thanks? Although I'd still rather carry the gun. She smiled. I know, she said. But you do realize that there are religious orders of warrior priests who carry weapons, right? Uh, right, I said, rolling my eyes. Marsha laughed again and we went back to work. You have been listening to Tales from Flat Space. If you want to support me in my writing, there are many ways to do it. Share this podcast, follow me on my Twitch channel, or buy my books. All you have to do is go to revginapon.net and click on the relevant links. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.